Good morning, everybody. We'll start our today's session. Distinguished speaker, Professor Jean Marisek, Senior Research Professor in Psychology, Swarthmore College, Pennsylvania, USA. Fellow academic colleagues and dear friends. On behalf of the OESL, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our distinguished speaker, Professor Jean, for accepting our invitation. Also, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this third lecture of the fourth Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the IRU in collaboration with the Department of Psychology and Counseling of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Center for Educational Technology and Media, and IT Department of the Open University of Sri Lanka. The Open University of Sri Lanka continuously engage in establishing collaborative relationships to increase its international reputation, build its global profile, increase the recognition of its academic offering, and conduct high impact research. Today, we are happy to ha uh, have Professor Jean with us to deliver his distinguished lecture on ethics in psychology, global, and Sri Lankan context. Now I would like to invite Dr. Gayani, the head department of psychology and counseling to give the introduction. Welcome everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Jean Marasek uh, to Open University and our department as well as the SETME. So let me briefly introduce Professor Jean Marasek and her work uh, that has spanned over more than two decades. Professor Jean Marasek completed her doctoral training at Yale University, USA with a joint degree in clinical psychology and social psychology. Her interest in clinical psychology and social psychology and her latest, latest interest in social sciences more broadly have been rooted in her conviction that psychological suffering and well-being are not person-level phenomena but are best understood embedded in social structures, cultural specific worldviews and local relationships. After completing her doctoral studies, she became a member of the psychology department at Smothmore College, Pennsylvania, as well as being a member of the program in women's and gender studies. Now it's called gender and sexuality studies. In early 1970s, she served on a task force to develop guidelines for non-sexist therapies for the American Psychological Association. Much of her research and writing has focused on questions of how cultural values and worldviews shape psychological practice, theories, and knowledge in diverse locals. She often uses qualitative research methods, and she is the co-author of a textbook for psychology students on how to conduct qualitative research, which has become a very valuable resource for psychology students everywhere. Her relationship with Sri Lanka, which we are very proud of, begins in uh, 1988 when she came to Sri Lanka as a Fulbright Scholar to University of Peradeniya. During her stay there, she not only engaged with the colleagues at Peradeniya University, but she convened a seminar on gender and women's studies for university scholars and local activists at the Institute for Fundamental Studies in Hamtana. This uh, became one of the early precursors to her work that she's continuing up until now. Since then, she has been a regular visitor to Sri Lanka, supporting the development of psychological field and those who are engaged with it. Her research interest currently stands on gender relations and gender dynamics in couples and families, suicidal behavior and suicide-like acts among young people in Sri Lanka, and the development of qualitative research methods. Currently, she is the editor of Feminism and Psychology Journal, and she is a William Ken Kennan Professor Emerita at Swarthmore College, Pennsylvania. Now, I cordially invite Professor Jean Marsek to deliver the lecture titled "Ethics in Psychology: Global and Sri Lankan Context." Professor Marsek. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be at the Open University. I've known about the Open University and had 
uh, distinguished and very interesting colleagues from the Open University for quite a long time. So I'm happy to be with all of you today and to be meeting some of you for the first time. I want to talk about ethics today because I think ethics is a kind of cornerstone of professional associations. And in my many years here, I've watched the discipline of psychology really come into being. I mean, be born, go through growing pains, and now it's really kind of on the cusp of being a full-fledged adult di uh, discipline and, uh, and practice, and I'm very happy about that and happy to watch things sort of blossom um, and come, you know, sort of come, come to fruition. That, of course, means a whole other raft of challenges uh, to tackle, and ethics and ethical codes is one of them. All the human service professions, psychologists, counseling, psychiatrists, social workers, doctors, all of them have ethical codes of conflict. Uh, those codes entail a responsibility to promote or guarantee or safeguard the welfare of clients or patients, as well as the responsibility to assure clients' rights. These responsibilities are not always easy to put into practice. Sometimes, ethical principles may seem to conflict. Um, each defines an ethical course of action, but they point in different directions. Sometimes protecting the rights of one party may conflict with protecting the rights, what seem to be the rights of another party. Sometimes uh, psychologists and other human service professionals may find that there are laws that constrain them from taking certain actions which they regard as ethical actions. And I'll give you some examples of all of those as I talk. In this lecture, I want to discuss ethical codes of conduct and some key ethical principles for human service professionals. I'll also describe some recent controversies regarding ethical conduct by psychologists in Western high-income countries, particularly the United States, which is where I'm from. I'll also suggest some ways, and I'll be eager to have your feedback during our question and answer period, some ways in which the ground realities in Sri Lanka can influence the development and the implementation of ethical codes of conduct for psychologists here, both practitioners and also researchers. Most psychotherapists, counselors, clinical psychologists, at least formally uphold ethical principles of their professions. A commitment to the welfare of clients, a commitment to assuring their rights. In the United States, for example, the ethical standards of psychologists promulgated by the American Psychological Association says, psychologists respect the dignity and worth of the individual and honor the preservation and protection of fundamental human rights. The ethical principles endorsed by the American Psychiatric Association enjoin psychiatrists to render service to humanity with full respect for the dignity of individuals and to safeguard the public against physicians deficient in moral character or professional competence. In the US, the National Association of Social Workers defines the social worker's primary ethical obligation as the welfare of the group and the individual served. Although the content of ethical codes focuses on the rights, dignity, and welfare of clients, if we look back into history, we see that the original impetus for professions to put such codes into being was really quite different. Historically, ethical standards were developed to protect the professions, not the individuals. By asserting that professions were able to regulate themselves, uh, the professions could ward off the threat of being regulated by an outside agency, by the law, uh, in psychology maybe, by the medical, the medical association rather than the psychology association, and so on. Furthermore, ethical codes allowed uh, the human service professions to maintain their reputation and their integrity by providing a formal mechanism to disavow the unacceptable actions of individual members. And that continues to be an important part of, the, uh, of, of ethics codes, though not the central one. Today, as practitioners and as teachers and supervisors of students who intend to become practitioners, and as researchers 
and teachers and uh, of research uh, students who intend to become researchers, we need to put our main focus of attention on protecting the rights and protecting the welfare of clients and research participants, not on guarding the reputation of the profession. If we do the first, the second will kind of take care of itself. Let me take the ethical code of the American Psycho Psychological Association as uh, an example and consider some of the implications for practitioners. The code makes it clear that uh, psychotherapists and consultants bear responsibility for protecting their clients' rights. There's several reasons for this. First, when people come to therapy, they do so in a help-seeking posture, not in a self-protective posture. Often, there are people who are in crisis. They need immediate support and relief. Uh, they need reassurance, and that takes precedence over asserting their rights uh, and their autonomy. Second, in many cases, and I think this is, might be more true in Sri Lanka than in the United States, the therapy situation is a new one for clients. Clients might not know how they should behave, what role they should assume, what rights they, uh, they can exercise in that situation. Often clients assume that a psychotherapist is like a medical doctor and his or her judgment should not be questioned. But psychotherapy is not a matter of giving out prescriptions or tablets um, as medicine is. I suspect this will be a particular problem in Sri Lanka where doctors tend to take, in my experience, a very hierarchical, very top-down stance towards patient and they expect uh, unquestioning adherence that would be less true um, in the United States these days. So to the extent that people co come to a therapist, imagine this is like going to a doctor, they're likely to be uh, more passive, uh, less autonomous, less uh, concerned about uh, knowing what their rights are and uh, engaging in conversations about those rights with the therapist. Third, some clients who enter therapy are not capable of asserting their rights. They may be members of social groups that have historically had very little autonomy, such as members of certain ethnic minority groups or people from deprived social backgrounds. They may have had their rights habitually denied by people in positions of authority, and they may be just resigned to having their needs and protests and concerns go, uh, go unheeded. When therapists work with clients from such backgrounds, they need to take special care to describe the give and take relationship of therapy, the negotiation between client and therapist about goals of therapy, arrangements for therapy, um, how to proceed in therapy, what is acceptable and, and what's not. Uh, therapists also need to take special care <coughs> to clearly uh, inform clients about what rights they have. So what are some of the rights that clients have? The first broad right concerns informed consent. This, of course, is also uh, a right that client, uh, participants in research have. Uh, the therapist's goals and the client's goals need to be congruent, need to mesh with one another. So they need to come to a mutual agreement regarding what are the goals that are being pursued um, in this treatment. Clients have a right to know what will be expected of them in the course of therapy. Uh, they need to know how long the treatment might be expected to last, what the payment arrangements are, and what the intended outcome is. Clients also should be told about the possible negative outcomes of therapy. For example, family therapists came to know that marital therapy uh, does not ensure that a marriage that's having difficulties will be put back together. Marital therapy sometimes uncovers problems and revelations and so on that lead the marriage to break down completely. Um, we do have quite a bit of literature now on therapy outcomes that actually talks about forms of therapy that can harm people. I'll mention some of them later. Um, and practices in therapy that are likely to be harmful. And those of you who are studying to be therapists, I hope will study that material in the course of your study. Therapist uh, clients also need to know something about the likelihood that therapy will be successful. 
let me give you an example from the biomedical field, biomed biopsychiatry, uh, about a current treatment that's often um, widely advertised. Uh, this is a treatment called transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation. It's a treatment for depression. Um, in TMS, a magnetic field is applied to the area of the brain, I mean, through the scalp, uh, scalp uh, that might be involved in, depre in depression. Uh, it's applied three times a week for several weeks. Uh, sometimes it helps, but the research evidence suggests that it's very rare that it helps. Um, it's very expensive. A course of treatment in the US is $10,000. That's expensive. Um, so before a client would choose to undergo a course of TMS, he or she needs to be very carefully informed about the likelihood that it will be helpful. In the case of psychotherapy, uh, we can rarely offer such um, um, sort of cut and dried facts. This proportion of people who get this kind of treatment, tra uh, magnetic stimulation applied to the brain, um, this, this many people get better after this many sessions. Therapy isn't like that. It's not like a, a, a medical treatment. In the course of a therapy relationship, people's ideas about themselves often change, and that's a good thing. Uh, their goals may shift, that's a good thing, um, and their goals may deepen, also a good thing. For example, a client may come to therapy to work on feelings of depression, low energy, fatigue, lack of interest, um, and so on. But when those feelings begin to lift, they may realize now they have the energy to work on some other issues, maybe changing a career, or working towards a more equal relationship with their husband or their wife. So saying to people, this many treatments will, is likely to lead to this particular outcome doesn't work in psychotherapy the way it would work in biomedicine. Because as I say, it's a human relationship. It's being re renegotiated all the time. Goals are being renegotiated. The person's sense of themselves may well be changing uh, as a result of therapy. And those are things that good therapists Keep, keep, uh, keep on track with, with their patients and have conversations with their patients as therapy is unfolding. What is changing from you? Where are we now? How are we gonna proceed? Let me shift the focus a little bit now uh, to talk about um, another facet of clients' rights to informed consent. Consider a case in which a parent brings a child uh, for treatment. Who's the client and who sets the goals? Um, is the client the parent who's paying the bills uh, or the child who's undergoing treatment? Well, it's kind of a little bit of both. And both of those parties have to be in on the negotiations about the goals of therapy, the arrangements of therapy, the likely um, um, processes that will be involved in the therapy and so on. Um, sometimes there's no disagreement between a child and parents about what, what the child is being brought to therapy for, uh, and no disagreement with the therapist about what the goals should be. But sometimes there is. For example, when a child uh, is an adolescent and the parent disapproves of the child's behavior, that's a situation where you are likely to have conflicts of interest. The parent who's paying the bill may have a different agenda than the child who's being, uh, who's being brought to treatment. One such instance is a child who's come to, an adolescent child, a teenager, who's come to experience his or her sexual orientation as gay or lesbian. And this is against the parent's uh, values or religious beliefs. The parent may press the child into what's called conversion therapy or reparative therapy. And sometimes the procedures that have been used in those kinds of therapies, uh, which are now uh, um, proscribed by the American Psychological Association and also against the law in some parts of the United States, sometimes those procedures were physically painful, involving decondition or attempting to decondition sexual arousal by using electric shocks. Um, we would not pursue that course of action now, and that a therapist who pursued such a course of action might well be 
uh, have an ethical complaint lodged against them uh, by their colleagues or by, by someone else. Of course, in the USA now and many Western high-income countries, there have been dramatic changes regarding social and cultural values around non-heterosexual orientations. Um, in Western high-income countries, uh, many of, there are now many legal guarantees to equal rights and equal treatment. In many Western high-income countries and some other countries as well, marriage equality laws have been passed. Um, these laws enable uh, uh, two men uh, who are a couple to marry legally, two women who are a couple to marry, to have children, uh, to raise families, and so on. Uh, the mental health professions help to foster these changes. 45 years ago, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, which uh, um, 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 is the, it writes the, uh, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and in that way is in charge of what things should be considered men a, a mental health problem or not. 45 years ago, the American Psychiatric Association declared that homosexuality was not a mental illness. 20 years ago, uh, the American Psychological Association took the further step of enjoining therapists not to engage in reparative therapy or conversion therapy that was aimed at changing a client's sexual orientation. They gave three reasons um, why therapists should not uh, engage in those kinds of therapy. Number one was maybe the most straightforward, those therapies don't work. Um, number two, forcing a client to undergo conversion therapy is a violation of his or her rights and his or her autonomy. And number three, the American Psychological Association said, offering conversion therapy, saying that conversion therapy is a, a, a legitimate form of therapy uh, as an avenue of change promotes discriminatory attitudes against people who are not heterosexual. Uh, it implies that there's something that ought to be remedied um, in people who are not heterosexual. Furthermore, the American Psychological Association, uh, as an organization with an ethical commitment to advance, uh, to benefit society and to improve people's lives, has um, been active in uh, writing legal briefs for major court decisions concerning gay and lesbian rights. It's issued public policy, public service announcements uh, about scientific findings concerning members of sexual minority groups. For example, scientific evidence um, saying that uh, children raised by two parents of the same sex are just as uh, healthy and successful and high achieving and and, and mentally healthy as parents, children raised by heterosexual parents. There's plenty of scientific evidence about that. Getting the scientific evidence out into the public arena was something that the American Psychological Association uh, took on as part of its, et its ethical responsibility to promote the welfare of society. The American Psychological Association has um, uh, taken seriously this commitment to enhance the welfare of society also by speaking out on domestic <laughs> violence, for example. Um, Sri Lanka is a different story, right? In Sri Lanka, as far as I know, homosexual acts are still proscribed by the law, and there are not yet legal guarantees of personal rights and equal treatment. That presents a more challenging case for uh, therapy ethics. Nonetheless, I think the principle that clients must be informed about and consent to the goals of treatment still holds. Whether and when Sri Lankan associations of psychologists and counselors might be ready to share scientific information with the courts or with the general public, I can't say. Um, but I hope on the long-term agenda of the associations of psychologists, there is some attention will be paid to the association's role uh, and ethical responsibility in uh, uh, sharing scientific evidence with the public. Promoting the welfare of society in general 
not just the welfare of individual therapy clients, is one of the ethical responsibilities of the profession. Now I want to take up a second important ethical issue, and this is the issue of confidentiality in therapy and privileged communication uh, in therapy. At least in the context of Western societies, the therapeutic relationship has always been assumed to involve confidentiality. There are some theorists who trace it back to the, the Catholic idea of confession and the confessional. There's lots of differences, obviously, but the notion of a private, confidential relationship uh, in which things, uh, the client should be free to disclose and is required to disclose uh, feelings, personal histories, experiences, and so on, without fear that those disclosures will go beyond uh, the therapy room. That has always been uh, a cornerstone of psychotherapy. But guarantees of confidentiality, in fact, are not absolute. And this is something, again, that's important for therapists to understand and important for therapists to tell clients about. For example, therapists may be required to share in the US, where often uh, insurance companies pay for health care and mental health care, therapists may be required to share information with insurance companies uh, about diagnoses, progress reports in therapy, therapeutic goals, and so on. Otherwise, the therapist doesn't get paid, and then the client can no longer continue therapy. So that's a limit um, on confidentiality. Therapists are very careful to make those uh, notes and communications and progress reports as empty as they possibly can and to keep a sort of private set of notes for themselves that's different from the set of notes they're required to turn over to bureaucracies, but nonetheless they do have to turn something um, over. And that's uh, often a um, a, a, a reason for conversation between therapists and clients. I need to tell them this, is that okay with you? If not, what can we say? Uh, and so on. It's very different from the idea of the confessional in terms of having a, a third party sort of elephant in the room uh, uh, watching over you. Um, another limit on confidentiality. About 40 years ago, uh, there was a major legal case involving, in California, involving a therapist um, uh, who was seeing a client. It actually was a student therapist who was seeing a client who was also a student at the university, uh, who was seeing a client who threatened, told the therapist uh, that he was angry at his girlfriend for breaking up with him and he was going to kill her. The therapist took this, after a while, took this to be a credible threat, especially when the client said he had a gun. Uh, he tried, the therapist tried to inform people to do something, and things happened, and the, the information didn't, wasn't taken seriously, and so on. That case, which was argued in several courts of law, uh, that case, you might know it if you've studied ethics, you might know it by name. It's always called the Tarasoff case. Miss Tarasoff was the woman who got shot, actually. She was also a student, uh, and her family uh, sued the university, sued the therapist, sued the um, therapeutic center, and, uh, and so on. That case established the Tarasoff principle, which says that clients' rights to confidentiality um, uh, must be breached if the therapist believes that uh, there is an imminent danger to someone else, a clear and present danger to someone else. The difficulty, of course, for therapists is judging future danger, judging what's imminent danger, judging what threats are serious, rather than someone who's angry in therapy but isn't going to act on those threats, is very difficult. It is not a matter of, of uh, drawing on some scientific criteria or questionnaires or scales or blood pressure measurements or something. It's a very difficult um, uh, judgment to make. Um, a third instance in which confidentiality cannot be absolutely guaranteed um, includes situations in which a child who is a client in therapy uh, 
uh, discloses that he or she uh, has been physically or sexually abused by an adult. In such cases in the US, and I believe this is also true in Sri Lanka, I'm not sure. Uh, in such cases in the US, therapists are mandated by law to report the abuse to child protection authorities. Um, therapists do not always find these situations easy to work with uh, and do not always find them um, in the best interest, actually, of the client. Reporting that a child has been the victim of abuse to child protection authorities almost certainly means that the therapeutic relationship is going to come to an end. The child is going to be taken away. Uh, legal proceedings will start. Maybe the child will be taken out of the house. It just moves the whole situation into another arena, a legal arena, a child protection arena, and away from uh, a, a therapeutic arena and an intimate therapeutic relationship. Um, and the law tends to be a very blunt instrument. Everyone gets treated the same. Uh, there are few exceptions. There's not a lot of attention to extenuating circumstances or uh, context and complications. For example, uh, I know situations like this in Sri Lanka, also in the United States. Suppose a 15-year-old girl is in a common law marriage to a 19-year-old boy. Technically, that's child sexual abuse and should be reported by a therapist uh, by law to the child protection agencies. It doesn't matter if the relationship is consensual. It doesn't matter if both sets of parents approve of the relationship. It doesn't matter if the couple are living together and have their own house. Technically, he's 19, he's an adult. She's 15, she's a child. That's child sexual abuse. Um, therapists find that very difficult um, and uh, they're often faced with situations where they don't think the best course of action is calling in the child protection agencies. I'll tell you some of the strategies um, uh, that, that parents, uh, therapists use to get around that. But let me first give you a third example, not as dramatic as the uh, situation of child sexual abuse. Um, therapists who work with children may find themselves faced with parents who want to know what the child revealed during the therapy session. I'm sure this happens in Sri Lanka. I'm sure. It also happens in the United States. I think it's probably even more likely uh, to happen here, knowing about the ways that families interact and the ways that parents perceive their obligations and responsibilities uh, towards their children, even their teenage or young adult children. One of the strategies that parents, that therapists in the US use uh, in situations where they are afraid that the guarantee of confidentiality that they've given to clients actually can't be sustained, it, whether by law or whatever else, something will happen, is to try to be as proactive as possible. Um, to tell parents ahead of time what the rules for confidentiality will be, or to tell a client, you know, these are the things these are the areas where you can speak freely and confidentially, but then there's some areas where I will be required to make a report to the authorities um, if you disclose this. There are therapists who will, uh, in the course of a conversation, if they sense that a child is about to reveal something that must be reported to the law and then set a whole process in motion that's then out of the therapist's control, the therapist may say, Please, before you say what I think you're going to say, um, please know that if you say X, then I will need to do Y. It's, it's, you could say it's kind of go, violating the, the uh, adhering to the letter of the law and violating the spirit of the law. A therapist would argue that it's, it is in the patient's, the client's best interest and in protecting, uh, protecting the client from harm and enabling the therapist to continue working with the client. There's a third ethical principle that I want to talk about. And this is another one that I think is complicated, going to be complicated uh, in Sri Lanka. And that is the ethical principle that therapists must not practice beyond the limits of their competence. But how do therapists know what the limits of their competence are? 
Uh, I think about Sri Lanka as I know it today, as I've watched the field of counseling, psychotherapy, clinical psychology, all those related fields grow. Um, I've watched the proliferation of unregulated counseling diplomas, programs, certificates, whatever, many of them taught by individuals uh, with uncertain credentials, no standardization regarding the curriculum, um, what ought to be the minimum uh, body of knowledge that people um, are, uh, have gained competence in, no, sometimes no minimum um, credentials for a student or criteria for a student to enter. How do graduates of such programs know what their level of competence is? Um, and what are they taught to do when they feel that they're out of their depth, when they're faced with a situation that they, that's beyond their control or they don't know what to do? I think that that is a set of problems that bona fide professionals, trained professionals coming from uh, serious programs in psychology, like you all, like the one here, uh, that is a problem that I see uh, bona fide professionals will have to address um, in the future. Even in well-resourced, legitimate, accredited training programs, and now I'm thinking about the United States where programs are accredited, they're visited, they're visited every couple of years to make sure they still have the necessary faculty, the necessary library resources, the necessary curricula, uh, and so on. Um, therapists are licensed, their license needs to be kept up by continuing their education every year, and so on. Even in uh, those kinds of training programs and those kind of training experiences, students in counseling and clinical psychology often don't have the knowledge they need to practice competently with all groups across society. In particular, uh, they often have not studied the social, economic, and cultural oppressions experienced by certain groups of people, um, and they haven't um, studied their, the importance of those oppressions in creating psychological distress and psychological suffering. In the United States and the UK, um, training in psychotherapy often emphasizes, really puts a spotlight on the client's contributions to their problems. And it underplays the contributions of social forces, external pressures, material limitations, and so on. That's not surprising if you think about the discipline of psychology and the way the discipline of psychology developed in Western high-income countries. It has been shaped by a cultural ethos that started back in the Enlightenment, um, a cultural ethos that sees the individual as, the, as determining his or her fate. If you think about, I don't know how much um, contemporary uh, US psychology you all have been reading in your coursework, if you think about uh, concepts, psychological concepts like resilience, grit, imposter syndrome, power posture, objectified body consciousness, growth mindset, rumination, emotional intelligence, coping strategies, on and on and on. All of them put their focus on the inside of the individual and imagine that strengths or whatever inside the individual uh, can determine uh, the individual's fate. Um, and they underplay or ignore the context that surrounds the person. So for example, people who um, are, are um, um, proponents of grit, the idea that what makes children achieve in school is their determination and passion. Well, then they look at ghetto schools where, uh, schools in very low income areas in the United States where there are no books, the children come to school without breakfast, the bathrooms don't work, the furniture is broken, the teachers come and go and are trying to get out of the school as fast as they can because it's a terrible place to work. These children's problem is not grit. These children's problem is a context that isn't supporting them um, in their learning. Many years ago in the United States, I think this doesn't happen so much anymore because we've had a sea change uh, regarding violence against women, intimate violence. 
When psychologists in the US first came to realize the extent of physical violence in couple relationships, psychologists asked, well, why don't those women just leave? I mean, you know, if you all study uh, that, you know this is a classic question. Why are those women so foolish? Do these women have masochistic personality disorder? What? Um, in the Sri Lankan context, I have heard counselors provide anger management to women, not to the men who beat women up, but anger management to the women who get beat up uh, as a way, uh, uh, if you could learn not to get angry um, when you're being verbally and physically abused, then you wouldn't be hit. Um, that kind of reasoning is an example of thinking on the inside um, when you should be looking uh, on the outside. There are progressive schools of psychotherapy, family systems therapy, feminist therapy, narrative therapy, that have created alternative therapeutic practices that take a more uh, contextual view. Let me shift just quickly to talk from counseling and psychotherapy to the research situation. The same core principles apply in the research situation. Researchers are responsible for guaranteeing rights of their research participants and for promoting the welfare of their research participants. Uh, one of the things that I always tell my students is, remember, participants in research studies are doing you a favor by participating in your research. They're not getting anything by helping you with, with uh, their research. Don't tell yourself they are. Um, they're giving you their time and effort, and they deserve to be treated well and fairly as a result. Uh, informed consent, those of you who've taken research methods courses, I think know um, that informed consent involves telling people about risks um, of participating in the project, helping them understand their rights. They can withdraw at any time. They can refuse to answer any questions you ask. They can ask that their material be withdrawn from the study, um, and so on. Uh, if we had more time, I would talk with you about deception uh, in research and the complicated questions about deception. When you don't tell people what it is you're doing, or you tell them you're doing something that's quite different from what you're doing, um, informed consent and deception uh, don't really go together. Um, if the research is rigged in certain ways and clients don't know it, um, then they haven't received informed consent. Um, partly, the issues um, uh, of, of uh, uh, deception and informed consent are m mitigated a little bit by debriefing, but the question of whether deception is okay what kinds of deception are OK? Um, when is deception OK? These are not settled matters. Um, they're still very much uh, up for debate. Those of you who've studied psychology probably know the famous Stanley Milgram obedience experiment. That was the experiment. It's many years old now. It's from the late 1960s. Kind of blew open the door um, about deception. Uh, Milgram brought people into a laboratory. They were told that they were, it was a, a learning situation. Uh, th they could see through the, the, a, a glass window someone who was hooked up to various machines, uh, and the, the, who was not really hooked up to any machines, just appeared to be. And the machines were supposedly delivered electric shock. The teacher, who was the participant in the study, was supposed to shock the person every time they got a wrong answer and turn the shock meter up and shock them more and more and more. Um, and the participants were continually prodded by the experimenter. Go on, go on. The participants were very upset. Some of them were sweating, they're protesting, and so on. And the experimenter just says, go on, next trial, uh, and so on. Um, as I say, lots of discussion uh, about that experiment. I don't think we have time for me to tell you about it. Now I'm getting the high sign here about it. Um, and that experiment probably could not be done. Uh, in the United States anymore. It would be um, um, beyond what would be, ethically, um, what would be ethically required. I want to shift now um, to a, a, a third part of my talk, and I'll be very brief about that. I've been talking as if ethics is purely a matter of uh, uh, what an individual therapist or an individual researcher does vis-a-vis -vis a client or a research participant um, or a patient. But 
ethical codes are not this uh, very individualistic matter. Ethical codes need to be built up around shared understandings, shared practice, a shared commitment among members of a profession. Um, the teaching of ethics has to be wrapped into uh, the teaching of other professional practices. Senior members of the profession have to model um, ethical conduct um, for those just starting out in the profession. Institutions, Universities, clinics, hospitals, scientific journals, professional associations have to hold their members accountable uh, for adherence to ethical codes. And they must have ways of adjudicating uh, ethical complaints. Um, and they must have sanctions that they can impose on people who violate the codes. Some of the sanctions um, uh, in Western high-income countries, you might a therapist who seriously violates an ethical code might lose his or her license to practice. He might be, he or she might be fired from a university post for fraud, fraudulent research, for plagiarism, um, for uh, mistreatment of patients or uh, 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 research participants. Um, you might be barred from receiving research grants for a certain number of years. You might be barred from supervising graduate students. Um, some ethical violations might also be tried uh, in a court of law. Um, to go back to something I said in the very beginning, if professional associations fail to regulate themselves, then their members are likely to be regulated by other bodies. And that is likely to be less satisfactory um, so uh, professional associations must not only have codes, they also must have procedures for uh, conscientiously adjudicating, uh, adjudicating those complaints. That I see is uh, an arena that a kind of next step, a next stage for the development of the professions psychological professions and counseling professions in Sri Lanka. And I look forward to seeing how it unfolds. Thank you. Yeah. Do I have to turn this on? No, I can't okay. do that. Uh, Thank you, Professor Jane, for that very insightful as well as very um, experienced lecture about some of the things that you have experienced in US as well as, as, well as in Sri Lanka. So um, just picking up on uh, just one thing when you talked about, um, I thought I found interesting. So you were talking about this negative outcomes, uh, informing mm. the client about negative outcomes. Um, wouldn't that, I mean, on a, if you are actually sort of thinking about a professional career or your sort of service to the client, um, I, I'm just trying to think of the impact it might have on, a, on your sort of a career or your service to the client. How would you sort of uh, deal with that? I'm just uh, Well, I think d being honest about the likelihood of the, the range of outcomes that are possible uh, it's a matter of honesty and, and a matter of informed consent. I mean, if uh, the example I gave of trans, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, it's not a psychologist example, mm. but to say to somebody, oh, you're uh, experiencing severe depression? Um, we have a treatment. It's very expensive. Mm. It will take you six weeks coming every day to have this thing applied, but you should try it. Well, if you said, and the chances are 3% that it will help you, mm. That would change the client's decision making. They may still agree to do it, hmm. yeah. but they would know what they were agreeing to. Um, if I think if if therapists are not honest about the range of outcomes hmm. and the possibility of of either no effect yes. in that case or of harm, hmm. uh, in the long run, the the profession is going to be better off. Yeah. Again, yeah, I, I yeah. think it's also not just psychology. I think in any profession. Oh, yeah. Like even yeah. even a product, I think so. It, it's so that's where the ethics comes into play. I think like for the whole of yeah. any profession that you're providing a service, yeah. I agree. So uh, or a product. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. what is the sort of the efficiency that this would work right. on you? Like whether it's a smaller product that you use every day, 
to the highest right, level where right, you are right. talking. Anti-aging cream. You know? Yes, <laughs> that's a <laughs> very interesting. Not to work. <laughs> that's a very interesting conversation. I think we can probably have uh, in another <laughs> session. So um, I'll just invite um, anyone to sort of have a question because. I think the one that we talked about might sort of take a while to discuss. Anyone? Yes. I have several questions, but I'll ask one <laughs> to do with research ethics. Um, you were talking right at the end about um, informed consent and deception. And I was trying to think about, I mean, I think in all of our research, there is an amount of deception that happens because we don't want to influence the, um, the respondents about exactly what is it that we are looking for. So we kind of broaden the theme out um, and say, oh, we're you know, we looking at marriage and family, or we're looking at childcare, but what we're really looking at is a particular dynamic within that theme. Uh, so moving on from there, I was actually talking to one of my supervisees yesterday, and she was trying to understand the role of silence in violence against women, victims of violence against uh -huh. women. Asha, talk into the microphone. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I hate mics, but anyway. <laughs> um, so one of the things is that she she's a student um, and she's beginning to see um, clients in hospitals who are being referred because they have uh, long-term issues with headaches and backaches, which are usually psychosomatic in Sri Lanka, and point to other kinds of issues that are going on. So one of the things we were talking about is that she's beginning to sense that some of these um, clients are possibly victims of violence. Mm -hmm. And this is one way of talking about the fact that they're, they're, they're victims, but they can't say that I'm being beaten up at home, but I'm pretending to be having this horrible headache or backache, for, you know. So one of the things that we were discussing is, is it a possibility for her as a researcher that she records these conversations, then does a test, uh, some kind of screening test after the conversation to see whether they are actually victims of violence. Um, to see how then the how silence works in in the way they talk about or not talk about violence, because so the end goal is to say, okay, um, as a therapist we need to be attuned to the way people may talk about being victims, but not really say I am a victim. Does that make sense? That's about twelve questions yeah. <laughs> in, in there. <laughs> I think the question of to, to start out with, uh, when you said something like, well, well, when we explain our research to people, uh, in some ways we're always deceiving them in the sense that we don't tell them absolutely everything that we're doing and we hope to find and so on. Um, I, think, uh, I think you're right that we don't tell them absolutely everything, but I don't think we deceive them in the sense of saying, I'm studying X, but actually what I'm really studying is Y. Uh, if you say, I'm interested to hear about your family life, and in your mind you're interested in particular things about your family life, um, I don't think you're deceiving them. It's also true that you may find out that you're not interested in what you thought you were interested in after you proceed with the research. You may find out your ideas were, you were sort of barking up the wrong tree um, with them. So you would change. Um, you would change as well. There's so many kinds of deceptions or uh, indirection. Uh, or generalization in psychology. I think the kind of deception in the Milgram study where these participants think they're giving lethal doses, virtually lethal doses of electric shock to someone, um, that's very different from saying to someone, I'm doing research on family life, when in fact you're doing research on some particular facet, say mother-child interactions um, or something. Um, and the kind of deception that psychologists have spent the most time discussing and debating has been the Stanley Milgram variety. I can give you another example. Again, you would not do this, be allowed to do this research today. Um, around Milgram's time, late 60s, early 70s, a researcher wanted to create a distressing experience for participants because of something else he was doing. So participants who were young men, college students, university students, came into his lab, got all 
hooked up with gadgets and supposed wires and electric stuff and so on, and the um, which were really not hooked up to anything real it, it, that was measuring anything real. He showed them pictures of attractive young men in you know various like with their bare bodied and so on, and and um, these. Uh, Recordings started, you know, jumping all over the place, and the experimenter said, "Ah, it looks like you have homosexual tendencies. Look at that. Look at the needle jumping. I mean, that's a very different kind of deception. Um, and in that kind of deception, then, is a debrief sufficient? Debrief meaning at the end of the study, you say, you know, actually." I wasn't studying this. Actually, this machine wasn't hooked up to anything. Actually, this and this. I mean, you have to ask, if you lied once, why should they think you're telling the truth when you debrief them? Um, or do they still go away saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, maybe, but, 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 I think, but. Um, very, very different. And the situation where, where, that you're talking about, you probably wouldn't even think about the where you have an interview with a, about family life or something, and you're interested in a particular facet, would you think about debrief in that sense? No. It, it wouldn't make sense, because you haven't lied to them. You've spoken in more general terms um, uh, than you might have, but you haven't lied to them. You haven't misled them uh, in some way. Um, on the, I'm not quite sure how to get into your question about studying. Studying silence is really interesting, right? Um, uh, and, and important. I mean, there, there are times when people skim over things that are important and they have certain reasons um, for not including those, those things in what they say. Uh, sometimes they don't have a reason. It's just that's not their focus of attention, even though it might be yours. Um, I wasn't quite sure when you said uh, your student would talk to women about their you said they pretend to have headaches. I don't think they're pretending. They're having headaches. Um, but yeah. Um, I wasn't quite sure when you said afterwards she would give them a test to see if they were really abused, what that would. So these are clients that are coming in um, who are being referred by the psychiatrist to the psychologist. Right. And because they have these psychosomatic complaints. So you have a conversation with them. Um, and then you do a screening to see whether they are victims of um, abuse. Because if you tell them before that this conversation will be screened for, uh -huh. then it influences uh -huh. the conversation you're having. You're having a regular conversation. It is probably that they're not victims of um, domestic violence. Um, yeah. But it's a way of then recording conversations that potentially could be, and then seeing what signals exist in that conversation that point to. I don't see the ethical dilemma. Or because even are, the deception. Because we are not telling them we are recording it because we want to find out how you hide certain things. Uh, that seems to me to be very much like the case of, okay. of you're opening up. You've got lots of things you probably want, want, want to do. And then the conversation is going to talk about, turn to the question of domestic violence, which a good therapist would ask about anyway. Um, in a um, in a screening, okay. yeah, I don't. Uh, to to me, that doesn't that doesn't pose a problem, okay. and I wouldn't think of it as deception. Mm. Sister, I think you're just opening up. You are leaving it open because yeah. I mean, of course, you are studying. You might be intending to study silence about certain factors, but there may be other things. So you have to, as a, especially as a qualitative researcher. I think the student might be going in the qualitative sort of stream. So you have to be open to sort of your, change your interpretation as you go along as well, I think. Right. So right. It, it's not a case of deception at the beginning from the outset where you have set certain standards and rules, I think. Just, just to add to that. Any Thank other you. questions? OK. Um, uh, so I would like to thank everyone uh, who has come today, starting from my colleagues at the Department of Psychology and Counseling, uh, the SETMI, uh, the director, Dr. Chanta Vattavidana, including the staff who have helped us to do this, um, invited guests who have come uh, from other universities, uh, Professor Rajendra from the International Relations Unit, and the staff who have helped us to uh, compile this. 
And uh, finally, but most importantly, <laughs> Dr. Jean Marsek uh, for giving us such an insightful lecture and uh, giving us the sort of, I think, you have given us something to think about, certain things in future that what we can do, what we can think more about. So thank you, and we hope that to see you sometimes back when you are in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Thank, thank you, you all.